Hello and happy Friday. Uh, as usual, it is me, Alex Cox, here on a Friday to talk about all things Find My Past and genealogy. Uh, I will give it a few moments to let people join. We've got an interesting one today. It's going to be basically like an episode of Who Do You Think You Are, but without the celebrities' actual participation. <laughs> uh, we don't need that. Or without the exotic backdrops, uh, fascinating locations. Yeah, is who do you think you are from the Find My Past offices? Uh, yeah, so as I said, hello, happy Friday. I will give people a little bit more time to join. I can see we've already got about 30 people watching, which is lovely. Happy Friday. Hello, on your prompt as ever. Great to see you. How are you? Oh, up to 46. I will give it, I'd say we'll give it one more minute. I'll waffle on and then we will kick off in earnest. Uh, but yeah, so thank you very much for tuning in. As I was saying, um, today should be an interesting one. Um, it, we are going to be taking quite a detailed look at the family tree of one of my favourite actors um, and one of the best British actors of this generation, I would say, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, a name I often get wrong, Benadryl Cumberbun. I think I've said that one before. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, his family tree is even more interesting than his name. It, it, oh, I, I, I won't be able to go into everything because it just goes back so far and there's so much interesting stuff in there. But yeah, that will be the main subject of today's broadcast. The fascinating, fascinating, fascinating family tree of Benedict Cumberbatch. His amazing ancestors and also his surprising connection to a shocking, shocking, shocking Victorian murder murder mystery, you can kind of call it a mystery, murder case. It is all over our newspaper collections. And it's quite fitting, given that one of the most famous roles he is known for is Sherlock Holmes, a detective investigating murders. Uh, and one of his own ancestors was on the receiving end of a murder investigation. And we will, uh, so yeah, we will talk about that in a little bit. But quickly, let's say hello to everybody. Hello, Denise. Hello, Linda and Lossie. Hello, Karen. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Kim. Hello, Audrey from Meath. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to all. Uh, hello, Linda. Hello, Hilary. Oh, hi, Hilary. Uh, lovely to see you. Hello, um, I mean, your name. I mean, not, not you. It'd be great if I could see you. Um, hi, fa hi, fi hi, hi, hi. Uh, hi, Sue. Hi, Linda. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Anita. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Sue. Hi, Eric. Wow, so many hellos. What a nice way to end the week. And hello, Sue, in Blackpool. Uh, oh, what's Hilary saying? Uh, I know, ah, Hilary Gadsby. I know the per I know the person who has the Cumberbatch one name study. I was actually looking at that, Hilary, while I was doing this research. You can give them my compliments. It's very, very good. Um, yeah, the Cumberbatch name is a very distinctive name, uh, a very old name. And oh, I don't want to give any spoilers away before I actually start digging into the discoveries. Uh, so yeah, uh, hello Charlotte, hello L hello Rosie, hello, Ca oh hello Caroline from Liverpool, best seat in the world. Uh, <laughs> hello Charlotte, uh, big up Lincoln, big up Lincoln indeed. Hello Vivica, hello Bethany, hello Thomas, so many people. All right, well it's lovely to have you here. So do the intro, happy Friday. It is Found My Past Friday. If you're tuning in for the first time, we do these every single week. It's kind of like a social history podcast with video uh, where we talk about fascinating finds within the records, history behind the records, as well as tips for getting started, research advice, uh, and a bit of sometimes a bit of behind the scenes peeks at what's going on at Found My Past HQ. Um, but today, it's going to be a bit like an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? I said this at the start, but it's going to be a bit like an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? Minus the input from the actual celebrity. <laughs> no celebrity involvement. I'm afraid Benedict Cumberbatch is not in the office. I would love it if he was sat next to me now to go through these findings. He may know some of this. He may know very little of it. Who knows? I assume he knows at least some of it. Um, and as, as well as lacking the celebrity, we also lack the glamorous backdrops, given that uh, a lot of Benedict Cumberbatch's family, well, the Cumberbatch line, uh, hail from Barbados. Uh, and that would be nice, wouldn't it, if I could, could have gone over to Barbados to, to do this. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we will be looking at 
everything we found out about his family tree, his connection to the First World War, given that he is currently starring, well, not starring, but he's one of the main characters in 1917, Sam Mendes' Sam new World War I blockbuster, the subject of last week's video. And if anyone has had the opportunity to see it yet, I would love to hear your thoughts. I was going to go see 1917 on Saturday, but I came down with a rather nasty fever. I think everybody's ill at the moment. I phoned out of hours to try and get an appointment, well, not an appointment, but I'll be four hours, so I just didn't go. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've been a little bit sick this week, hence why I'm a little bit pale, and uh, my energy levels may be a little bit lower than normal. But um, yeah, I haven't got the chance to see 1917 yet. I really want to. Pretty much all my mates have, and everyone is saying the same thing. It's incredible. Um, I would love to hear your opinions as well. One, you say, I still think you should research Hugh Laurie since he's my cousin. Maybe we could work on it together. No, uh, we, we're really looking to do more uh, celeb family trees because I think it's a great way of illustrating what is possible um, to people who haven't done it themselves. I think when you can, well, you know, that's why, who do you think you are so popular? People watch you, do you think, you know, oh, I think I could never do that, but you can. All you need is uh, a bit of dedication, a couple of, a subscription or two, a uh, bit of elbow grease, and you're away. Um, I'll look at a few comments. Oh, Andrew Fielding. Hi, hi from Andrew. Just drove through Combabatch, Cheshire, which I imagine is where the surname probably did originate. That is a real coincidence. Um, oh, Brenda Stewart said, hi, how can I find out how to read the codes of the Royal Staff Records? I can't, can't find anywhere on your site that helps with this. Thanks. Oh, I think we did have a blog post on this a way back, but it might have been one of the ones that got uh, removed. Um, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, I, if anyone watching can help Brandon, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sorry, that's another thing to say if people are tuning in for the first time. One of the other great things about these videos is a lot of the people who you see commenting, uh, all the people saying hi, are incredibly knowledgeable genealogists. If you are just starting out, they're very, they're very willing and eager to help. Um, and very capable of helping as well. So if you do have any questions, you've, you've got a wonderful pool of knowledge to dip into now. Uh, I assure you, if you, you ask a question and someone can answer it, they will. Um, ah, Victoria Ann Walton, my first time. Well, I will try my best not to disappoint. Oh, Nicole Hassel said, my dad's seen it, said it's really good. That 1917, the film that is, my parents echoed the same thing. Um, Cheers, Thomas. Oh, yeah. And actually, that's going to be so sorry, sorry, sorry. Doing all the interesting stuff, right? Before we dig into the fascinating family tree of Benedict Cumberbatch, if you are tuning in for the first time, we do a question of the week. That's just to get the comments going and just to get a bit of a discussion going and encourage people to share. Uh, and, and given that we found such a shocking, um, I mean, I think a murder case is pretty shocking as far as family history discoveries go. Uh, we found something so scandalous in Benedict Cumberbatch's family tree. I wanted to hear what shocking discoveries from your family history have you made during the course of your family history research? Um, I haven't found out much shocking in mine, sadly. Mine all seem to have been pretty straight-laced. Apart from a case of uh, lying about military service, that is the extent of it. Uh, but yeah, we want to know about what shocking things you have uncovered. Um, Rosie Rowley has said, I found a few suicides, which, you know, back, back, in the day would have been considered quite a scandalous thing. Obviously now, thankfully, we're more compassionate and have a better understanding of mental health problems and, 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 and the pressures that, that can lead people to tragically take their own lives. But um, yeah, suicide is something that has been common throughout in all of human history, but due to the society's attitudes, it wasn't openly discussed. So if a suicide did happen in your family, that's, kind of, that's the kind of story that wouldn't have necessarily been passed down. And when you find out about something like that, Newspapers will often, you know, it, it will be in a newspaper somewhere, and that newspaper probably is online, given that we're so far through digitising all the British Library's collections now. You can find some really shocking, very, very sad details. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear from other people what kind of shocking uh, things you have found. Uh, Chessie Stanley said, uh, in answer to your shocking finds question, not my family, but my find, which you can still claim that. Jesse. Um, I found an article on the BNA about a chap who had attempted to commit suicide. It was her grandfather. There was a rumour he'd gone to prison, uh, but until then she'd never known why. If he'd gone to prison for attempting to uh, commit suicide, that does show how, how uh, heartless <laughs> society was back then by today's standards. It's 
crazy to think, isn't it? Um, uh, Anya said, uh, if any of you are wanting to research Scottish family, uh, do note that Scotland's people is now offline until Tuesday. I didn't know that. That's a good public service announcement. Thanks for raising that. But as she said, uh, we do have loads of Scottish records now, um, which we will be covering next week for Bond tonight. That was a really bad accent. I'm very sorry. Uh, but yeah, we'll be doing. We will be revisiting uh, Scottish records, Scottish family history next week because it is Burns night. But anyway, um, yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, as well, <coughs> if I managed to get through the entirety of Benedict Cumberbatch's family tree, because I'm not going to the entirety, but the entirety of what we've, the stories I've surfaced that I wanted to share. Um, earlier this month, I missed it, I forgot about it, but the 8th of January marks, the, marked, not marks, because it's gone, the 8th of January marked the 80th anniversary of food rationing being introduced in Britain. Um, it was a fact of life for pretty much every single one of our ancestors, if they were in this country at that time. Uh, and it lasted for a long time. You know, some of you may have even grown up <clears throat> when you were very young children while rationing was still in place. Um, if you have any memories of that, we'd love to hear them. Uh, if, you're, if you have any family stories or recipes passed down from rationing days, uh, do share them. Uh, you, they probably were passed down, actually, because there are a lot of rationing recipes in our newspaper collection. And as a general rule, they're disgusting. <laughs> they're not, it's not stuff you'd want to try uh, when you have access to actual ingredients. Um, but yeah, there's loads, loads and loads of rationing recipes in the newspapers. There's loads of make do with men tips, just loads of great wartime content stuff. I love that stuff. Uh, Louise Taylor has said, hi, Alex, can you recommend any particular directories? RE Middlesex, London, trade directories covering Enfield, Islington, Bethnal Green. Sorry if not related to theme today. That doesn't matter. Ask any question you want. It doesn't have to be related to the theme at all. This is a, an open space. You can ask whatever question you fancy. Um, I don't know in particular, but I, I, I mean, I just recommend going to our collection of Britain trade directories. Can't remember the date. Go to our A to Z of record search. Uh, I would, hang on, let me see if, I don't think I can post links to blogs, but I think I can post links to record sets uh, on Facebook Live. I'm a past trade directory. Yeah, so I'm afraid I'm not aware of any specifically for that region but i would just have a look in this larger collection um and see what turns up for that area i think that's your best bet um ah oh, Gemma nicholson hi from darwin australia wow you must be up early Gemma. i like that thank you very much for tuning in i feel honored uh not <coughs> uh <coughs> not proud to be back here though was born in darwin uh, through John Willis Nicholson from Colac, Victoria, and Jane Walsh from Carterton, New Zealand. Um, Rosie Morrow, question, qu qu uh, question of the week, only surprise was bigamy uh, on the conventional side of the family. Well, bigamy is pretty scandalous. Um, again, they're, they're another very interesting thing to find instances of if you find them in the crime records, because then match it to the newspapers and all the sordid details will spill out in front of you. And all those secrets that your ancestors thought probably died with them. You were resurfacing <laughs> maybe a hundred years on. Family history is wonderful, isn't it? Um, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul Achievers, first time too. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm glad you're here. Uh, my grandmother's mother died. Her stepfather married her aunt and continued to have children. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's not very conventional, is it? That's, that's a good one. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you tuned in to share that. That's, that is a really good one. Um, Sarah Sim Simpkin said, my grandfather spent a few days in jail, aged 14, for stealing a duck. Uh, um, uh, yeah, another one, another one comment from my chum Hillary. Um, yeah, obviously a lot of these shocking discoveries tend to be associated with crime. Uh, you, you're finding a lot of them in the newspapers. But as Hillary said, reports of accidents as well, mining disasters. I mean, fatal accidents were way apparently. Well, no, obviously they were. Fatal accidents were way more common. Um, even 50 years ago than they are today. Obviously, uh, some of you may not be particularly grateful for modern elf and safety. Sometimes it does encroach a little bit too far, but it didn't exist uh, when our ancestors were knocking around, no, nor did uh, the modern, modern medical science we can rely on when we shatter our limbs or sever important blood vessels. Um, yeah, so having a serious accident on the job was a much more serious um, matter back then than it was today and uh yeah very shocking when you find that 
Uh, great to see Sylvia sharing. Oh, star already sharing rationing history. Um, oh, and on your great uncle who was rather naughty in the military. He was constantly talking about to his superiors, ate more than his rations, and went AWOL. That is very naughty. He ended up trying to sign up to another regiment, got caught, and ended up in military prison, which was not a night nice <laughs> And uh, <laughs> accused of the above and bestiality. That is, that is shocking on you. Wow, you've uh, set the bar quite high for a question of the week. Uh, at the end of the war, he was meant to be on trial again, but they let him go and he'd managed to leg it to Australia. He sounds fascinating. Wow, what a, that, what a show. That's a bit of a loss for that one. Uh, Sylvia said, as a little girl, I played shop with my little sister using sweet ration coupons when they were no longer required. Oh, well, at least you found a use for them. Um, and someone else saying, uh, Sandy saying, I found some rationing stamps the other day. I'm, I'm in New Zealand. Petrol, tea, sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Right, I really should start talking about Benedict Cumberbatch, otherwise we're going to be here all blooming night. So, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend. The man um, with a fascinating name and an even more fascinating family tree. Just going to see the bell grey. So before I start looking at this, this research is actually something that I started right at the start of my career with my past, all the way back in 2013 when I first joined uh, the company as a fresh-faced youth of, oh, I don't know how old I was now. I'm a lot younger than I am now, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, this was one of the first research projects I embarked on with the assistance of a very, very, very talented genealogist, a gentleman named Roy Stockdale who some of you watching may have actually known. Uh, Roy is sadly no longer with us. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a great friend to find my past and a very talented um, researcher. And as an ex-journalist, he had a real knack for telling a story. So I just wanted to acknowledge Roy uh, and remember him because he, he was instrumental in pulling this research together. Lovely man, great genealogist, brilliant storyteller. Uh, and then over the, recently, we've kind of expanded on this a little bit and added a few extra bits and bobs. Um, so, Benedict. So, Benedict himself has often, well, he, he definitely said it earlier on in his career that he got quite fed up with people thinking that he was just this posh, upper-class toff because of his name and his accent and the roles that he, and, the, and I mean, and the fact that we went to Harrow Public School, which kind of does indicate a degree of poshness. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, I think my great grandfather went to Harrow before the family lost all the money. Um, he um, so yeah, he he, he actually he, in interviews he was quite candid about this and said that he got so fed up of it that at one point he considered quitting Britain for America because he reckoned that America was less obsessed with class. They, um, it's probably tr true to a degree. Uh, but um, if you're watching Benedict, you'll be pleased to know your family tree reveals that you're not all posh. In fact, your maternal side uh, was far from distinguished. Uh, it was generation after generation of humble farm labourers, domestic servants and tradesmen. So, um, yeah, there you go. Two halves making up the whole. Uh, your paternal line, on the other hand, Benedict, I don't know why I'm talking to Benedict like he's watching. It's safe to assume he's not. If you're watching Benedict, Make yourself known in the comments. I think I'd have a fit, actually. Um, but his father's, his paternal line, the Cumberbatches, uh, are very, very, very well to do. So Benedict himself was born on the 19th of July in 1976. Um, no, um, as Benedict Timothy Carlton Cumberbatch was brought up in um, Kensington. So yeah, Benedict, you are a bit posh, Benedict. Come on. Um, he's... He's kind of destined to walk the boards, I guess, because his parents were also well-known actors. His fa father, Timothy, Timothy Carlton, stage name, his real name was just Timothy, Timothy Carlton Cumberbatch, actually, uh, and Wanda Ventham. Um, and interestingly, Ventham and Cumberbatch are the two names that we are going to be following as we go on this journey through uh, the generations of his family tree. But yeah, as I said, he, he, uh, he was, at first he was, in fact, it sounds bizarre now because it's probably his great, as well as his acting ability, it's probably his greatest asset. Uh, but he was that bothered about people making assumptions to his name that at the start of his career, he thought about changing his stage name to Ben Carton. Um, well, actually, that's what he started out as. But when he finally 
got picked up by an agent. His agent went, are you mad? And they're like, Benedict Cumberbatch, change it back. He did. And that's when he started getting roles. Um, but anyway, so who were, we'll start with the Cumberbatch family first. There were quite a lot of individuals to go through. So we'll start with the Cumberbatches. So the Cumberbatches were basically a very, very, very prominent family. Uh, an English family, um, who knows, maybe from Comber batch in Cheshire, as one of our viewers uh, suggested before. Um, so they were a very, very, very prominent family of English merchants and adventurers, um, basically like a, a buccaneering, someone who went over to the colonies to find fame and fortune. Uh, but yeah, the Cumberbatches were very active in the 18th and 19th century. But the story actually begins when the, when the first Cumberbatches arrived in Barbados in the 1690s. I believe the first Cumberbatch to arrive was a gentleman called Joshua Cumberbatch. Uh, he will have been from money, uh, because being able to take yourself out to Barbados to set up plantations, you couldn't do that if you're working class. But um, anyway, so yeah, it all started with a chap named Joshua Cumberbatch arrived in Barbados in the 1690s. But I wasn't able to find that much out about Joshua. The first member of the family who I was able to find out a lot about was a chap called Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch. And that's who we're going to start with. So Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch was, ben is, well, was is Benedict's fifth great grandfather. So Abraham was born in 1726 and died in 1785 to give you a rough idea of when he was uh, knocking about. But he was not, uh, while he was born in Barbados, um, his parents weren't. In fact, Abraham Carton Cumberbatch wasn't even a Cumberbatch. Uh, Abraham Carton Cumberbatch was actually born Abraham Carton. His parents were uh, a Bristonial army man named Colonel Edward Carlton, who married Anne Cumberbatch, who was one of the plantation-owning Barbados Cumberbatches, um, but it was Abraham, the child of Colonel Edward Carlton and Cumberbatch, who was the one who really kind of started growing the family business and establishing the, dinner, the Cumberbatch sugar dynasty, if we can call it that. But did you notice something? Edward Carlton, born all the way back in 1704. What is uh, Benedict, one of Benedict's middle names? Carlton. What was his father's uh, stage name? Timothy Carlton. In fact, the Carlton name has stayed as a middle name in the Cumberbatch family since, seven, since the 1700s, since Edward Carlton, in, since Ab Abraham Cumber Carlton Cumberbatch. So it's amazing, isn't it, how, how long these things can kind of carry on for. Um, so anyway, back to Abraham. A A Abraham. Abraham. Oh, sorry. No, I got sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Someone had uh, someone had left their glasses case in my studio. Um, and they were just popping in to see if they could find their glasses. Anyway, so back to Abraham. So as Abraham was born Abraham Carlton and married Anne Cumberbatch, but under the terms of the will of his maternal grandmother, sorry, not Abraham. Um what am I talking about? I'm getting confused here. Too many cartons. Um, under the terms of the will of his, so yeah, Abraham would have was the son of Edward Carlton and Anne Cumberbatch, which means he would have been born Abraham Carlton. But under the terms of the will of his maternal grandmother, he would inherit all of his grandfather's estate. So this is the father of Anne Cumberbatch if he changed his name to Cumberbatch. I think the will said thereby retaining the name here in Barbados. Obviously, you're not going to miss up on the chance to inherit loads of profitable sugar on plantations if you're a seven if you're an eight 16th century adventurer so he did that uh, and the only way you could do that back then was by an act of uh, the Westminster Parliament so Abraham did this changed his name and became Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch and thereafter all made all male descendants of Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch uh, have added Carlton as their last Christian name all the way down to Benedict um, I can't remember if Benedict can have kids, but if he have, have has any sons, I wonder if they too are Carton. Anyway, so part of this inheritance included two sugar plantations, one called the Cleland Plantation and the other one called the Farm. Uh, and they are in the parish of St Andrew, um, which is a beautiful part of Barbados. I visited it for a day when I went on holiday there. It's one of the 11 parishes of Barbados. It's situated in the northern part of the island. Um, and... Even today, it's probably one of the more unspoiled parts of the island uh, because it's made up of 
green rolling hills, which has very, very fertile land, which is perfect for growing sugar. Uh, another thing that Benedict has acknowledged, this is a sh another shocking family history discovery. I... Cheers, Ivan. You don't have to watch it. Um, that threw me off, sorry. Um, so yeah, part of the re, what was the saying? Yeah, one of the things that Benedict has discussed before is, and it's a shocking discovery, is that the family did own slaves. They, it was a sugar plantation in Barbados and it was staffed by slaves. Um, he's been very open about this. He even said when he played Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger in the film Amazing Grace, um, obviously William Pitt the Younger was an, an, abilin as an abolitionist, um, Benedict hoped that it would act as some kind of apology or atonement for the sins of his ancestors. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they did own a lot of slaves. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of Cumberbatches still in Barbados today who are actually the descendants of slaves owned by the Cumberbatch family. Um, cause of course, slaves were often given the names of, of their masters and uh, on gaining their freedom, some took new names, some kept those names. And for that reason, there are still descendants of, 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 of these plantation slaves with the surname Cumberbatch in and around Barbados today, which I think is incredible. Um, but anyway, Abraham was um, quite a prominent person on Barbados. Uh, once he started growing his plantations, uh, he was appointed a, as a member of Her Majesty's Council in Barbados, which allowed him to call himself the Honourable um, Abraham Cumberbatch. And he held this position for around 30 years. Um, basically, anyone who served as a member of His Majesty's Council uh, was allowed to call himself Honourable because it was basically a, a kind of smaller equivalent of the English House of Lords, but for Barbados. So then we move on to Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch's son, conveniently also named Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch. So this Abraham Carlton Cumberbatch, so you're not confused, was born in 1754. He also served on the council just as his father did, but he ex expanded his father's plantations significantly. And his sons, John and Edward, took this even further. So by the time John and Edward had inherited uh, those two plantations from their father, They'd already set up two others that they owned jointly together, Nicholas and Edworth plantations. And by 1790, so pretty much a century after Joshua Cumberbatch arrived in Barbados in the 1690s, the family owned at least seven plantations, hundreds and hundreds of slaves, and they'd made enough money to start buying big country piles back in Britain. And Abraham Jr., actually died in one of these houses and is buried at Bristol Cathedral. You can actually find him in burial records for Bristol. Um, and there is a monument to him in, um, in, in Bristol Cathedral. And I have an example. I have, I have his monumental inscription in front of me, which I'll read a little bit to you here. But anyway, what, he died of a malignant fever uh, and he travelled back to England to his seat at Fairwater near Taunton, which is one of these big, big houses that would have been bought from the, with the profits of, of these sugar plantations. Uh, and he died on June the 16th, 1796, in the 42nd year of his age. But if you go into Bristol Cathedral and you walk to the choir vestry leading out to the East Cloister, which is apparently high up on the north, high up on the north wall, you will see a plaque to the memory of Abraham Cumberbatch Esquire. And the reason I wanted to read this out was because it's another reminder of how amazing um, monumental inscriptions are uh, how much information they can give about a person. So this one says, uh, to the memory of Abraham Cumberbatch Esquire, a native and inhabitant of the island of Barbados, senior member of his majesty's council of that island to which honourable board he had belonged for near 30 years. He bore a long and painful illness with uncommon patience and fortitude and came to England in hopes of receiving benefits from a change of climate and died in this city, July 25th, 1785. And then there's a little bit under that as well to test a, uh, a little bit of a, a poem written by his friends to testify, to te a testament to his character. So it says, in manhood's prime, here found a hasty end, the tender father, husband, brother, friend. Though blessed with wealth, no headstrong passion reigned, no spot of vice, his polished manners stained. Ye sorrowing friends who silent now draw near to wash his marble, with, four, with the falling tear, 
Mourn not his recompense thus early given. Submit with reverence to the will of heaven. Go, tread the upright path he ever trod, by men revered and welcomed by his God. So um, there you go. From just from that one monumental inscription, not only do we find the circumstances of his death, the fact that he, he had a long and painful death, he travelled back to England, you also have this poem from his friends testifying to what a great chap he was. I do wonder, though, if his slaves would have echoed these sentiment, sentiments. Probably not. Um, so yeah, those were the. So we'll, we'll move. There were there were many many more generations of Barbados Cumberbatches. Far too many to go into. The family kept on building um, these big big plantations. And when slavery was finally abolished, they'd made their money. Uh, they'd had all their big houses in England, and I believe that's when they started to return back to the United Kingdom to live in their big country piles and um, build new businesses with with the money they'd accumulated. So we're, we're going to skip forward hundreds of years now to uh, Benedict's grandfather, uh, the first connection we have um, to the First World War. So Benedict's grandfather was Lieutenant Commander Henry Carlton Cumberbatch. See, Carlton Cumberbatch still being used. Uh, and as you can tell by the title, Lieutenant Commander, he was a very, very, very distinguished naval officer um, and a well-to-do chap, so well-to-do, in fact, that his marriage um, in Kensington in 1934 to a lady called pa Pauline Congdon was actually reported in the Times. You had to be someone to have your marriage reported in the Times. Um, and their, their son, Timothy Carlton Cumberbatch, another Carlton Cumberbatch, is Benedict's father, and he was born in Reading, Berkshire, um, in 1939. So Henry Carton Cumberbatch, this is Lieutenant Commander Henry Carton Cumberbatch, he was born in uh, Izmir, Turkey in 1900. And the reason he was born in Izmir, Turkey was because his father, Henry Alfred Cumberbatch, uh, was the British consul for Turkey. And Henry's father, Alfred, uh, sorry, Henry's, Henry Alfred's father, Robert Cumberbatch, was also the British consul for Turkey. So quite a few distinguished ancestors in the coming batch line. Anyway, what happened to Henry during the First World War? So we were able to find Henry Carton Cumberbatch's uh, highly detailed Royal Naval Royal Navy service record in our collection of Royal Navy service records. And this record basically shows that after he finished his education at the Royal Naval College at Osborne and Dartmouth, uh, he was appointed as a midshipman on the 15th of August, 1917. And once he'd, been, once he'd been appointed as a midshipman, he served on board the renowned class battle, the renowned class battle cruiser HMS Repulse until January 1919. Um, and while he was, so he was, um, during this time, between 1917 and 1919, he did see action. In fact, he took part in uh, the one of the more notable naval engagements of the First World War. First World War was very much a land war. Um, the German Navy was pretty much boxed in pretty early on, so there wasn't that many big, apart from Jutland, there weren't that many massive naval engagements, not like the Second World War, where you had these huge, great big naval battles with catastrophic losses of life. Most of the bloodshed during the First World War was in the fields of France uh, and, and Belgium. Uh, but anyway, Henry fought in the Second Battle of Heligl Heligoland Bight. Uh, this was an uh, indecisive battle, but it was still a big one. It took place on the 17th of November, 1917. Incidentally, the year the film that Benedict is now acting in is set. And the reason for this battle was uh, a strong force of British cruisers under Vice Admiral Trevel 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 Trevelyan uh, Napier were sent to ambush German minesweepers, which were attempting to clear the, we basically, the English Channel had been mined so heavily. That's another reason why there wasn't that many big naval engagements. Um, and these German minesweepers were attempting to clear a channel through the British minefields uh, in this region, which was called Heligoland Bight. Um, and these, um, so Henry's ship, the HMS Repulse, was not actually part of the original battle formation. It was sent out to ambush these German minesweepers and their escorts. Uh, but when it, fat, when it heard the battle was going on, it broke away from its own squadron at high speed to join, join the fight, join the fight a little bit after the start. And it did score a direct hit on uh, a German light cruiser, SMS 
Koning, Konigsberg. Uh, this ignited a huge fire and put the ship out of action for the duration of the battle. Um, so yeah, that was Henry's War. So that's Benedict's first connection to the First World War. And uh, before we take a look at his maternal side, I am going to have a quick look at the comments. Um, ah, so I'm just having issues being able to reply. Yeah. Not sure what's going on there. Um, <laughs> Kevin Hunt. Ah, Kevin Hunt. Thanks, Kevin. For, um, thank you for updating. Benedict Cumberbatch's first child has Carlton in the name. Benedict Cumberbatch and his wife welcomed their first child, Christopher Carlton Cumberbatch, in 2015. See, they're carrying on that tradition that was started all the way back in 1720, whatever it was. Uh, their eldest child, affectionately known as Kit, uh, soon had a baby brother, Hal Auden Cumberbatch. How... Wow, I wonder if Hal Auden Cumberbatch could be the first Cumberbatch to break, to break this long tradition. Um, wow, thank you very much for updating me on that, Kevin. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, see what else everyone's saying. Yes, sorry. If, any, if people are just tuning in, you're wondering what on earth am I talking about? I've been talking about the family tree of Benedict Cumberbatch. The first section of the video, we talked about the Barbados Cumberbatches, the sugar plantations they established, how the family built up its wealth and started a kind of sugar dynasty uh, before buying some rather grandiose properties back in Britain and returning to Britain after slavery was abolished. Um, then we had a look at Hen Lieutenant Commander Henry Carton Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch's grandfather, who served um, at the Battle of Heligan Heligoland Bight in the First World War, and he was a very senior commander in the Second World War, um, but I didn't really talk about that. And now we are looking at um, his maternal side, who are no way near as distinguished. At the start of the video, we said how Benedict uh, originally got sick and tired of everyone going on about how posh he was. And if you are watching Benedict, your mum's side isn't that posh. So you're a real mix. It's not all hoity-toity tops. It's, uh, it is a mix of both. Um, oh, I did pronounce lieutenant just like an American. It's lieutenant. I'm terribly sorry. Too much Band of Brothers. That's what it is. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for correcting me. I did. I'm sorry, Ricky. I promise I won't do it again. Promise. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe I actually did that. Um, Sandra Tai said, my son-in-law's grandfather was William de Costa Cumberbatch and was born in Barbados. Well, Sandra, I think it's very, very safe to assume that he, uh, your son's son-in-law's grandfather and therefore your son-in-law is a distant relation of Benedict Cumberbatch. There you go. You tell him yourself. Um, ah, Sarah, uh, Sarah Tompkins said, I watched 1917 today. It is worth going to watch. Glad to hear it. That's my plan for tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, we've covered the uh, Barbados Cumberbatches. We've covered Lieutenant Commander um, Henry Carton Cumberbatch and his service during the Battle of Heligan, Heligoland fight. And now we are on to the less um, distinguished maternal line, the Venthams. So, Benedict's mother, the glamorous Wanda Ventham, she was a very well-known actress in her own right. She starred in, in some major BBC uh, TV series in the 1970s, one called The Lotus Eaters, which I believe was about two British expats running a bar on a Greek island. In, I think it was Crete. Uh, she also appeared in, an, in a load of sci-fi programmes, including one called UFO, which was very, very well known. Uh, but I think one of her more famous roles was actually the mother of Rodney's wife, Cassandra, in Only Fools and Horses. That's right. Benedict Cumberbatch's mum... Um, played Rodney's mother-in-law in Only Fools and Horses. I didn't know that. There you go. Fact for the day. Uh, so one of them was born. Um, I don't need to talk about her, actually. She's still alive. We will, we will, we will maintain, respect her privacy. Um, we will skip to her ancestors. So um, she was the daughter of a gentleman named Fra Frederick Howard Ventham uh, and his wife Gladys Frances Holtham. Uh, and they were married, according to our records, on the 29th of October, 1930, at Brighton Register Office. Um, and the marriage certificates showed that both were about 20, and Frederick's occupation was listed as a wine merchant's clerk. And from the marriage certificate, we get the name of his father, 
Um, Frederick William Ventham, who was described as a motor car proprietor, so a car dealer. And the bride's father, uh, Francis Leonard Holtham, was a furniture decorator. And Francis Leonard Holtham, uh, so Benedict's great grandfather, maternal great grandfather, is the next ancestor we are going to be looking at in detail. Uh, because Francis is um, has another connection to the First World War, mainly that he fought on the terrible bloody battlefields of the Western Front um, around the time that Sam Mendes' film is set. So um, Francis Leonard Holtham, as we said, he was a furniture dealer. He was born in St. Luke's in 1885, so definitely lower down the social hierarchy than the Cumberbatches. Um, and he can be found in our collection of British Army Service records. He can also be found in our collection of Britain Campaign, Gallantry and Long Service Medals and Awards. Wow, that is a mouthful. And also our collection of Silver War Badge records. And while we can find his service records, the only one page, one very, very charred page, has survived. The rest was obviously destroyed in the Arnside Fire of 1940, which... The exper you know, experienced researchers will know that 60% um, of all service records from the First World War were tragically destroyed by fire in the fire of uh, in 1940, and only 40% remain. Uh, but there are other resources we can use, which I will show you in a second. Well, I will not show you, I will tell you about in a second. Um, so only one charred page survives. It doesn't give us that much information. Um, but both his service record and his medal index card at least tell us that his uh, the battalion he served in, and that was the second twelfth ballot battalion of the London Regiment, uh, and they also give his give us his soldier number, which was four seven three one nine five. Again, very very useful piece of tool, and on the recommendation of our Anya and others, we will I will be writing a blog at some point about how you can use uh, soldier numbers to find out more than you probably realised you could about your ancestors' war. Um, so when we pop in that service number, just to double check, we the, the same record, uh, the same records come back, and then um, those are the only two records that match that name. So it's fair to assume that Francis stayed with this regiment for the duration of the war. But the battalion was actually quite an interesting one. The battalion, it was a volunteer battalion, but it had it was nicknamed the Rangers. So it was a volunteer unit that was formed in 1860 originally, uh, and it made a name for itself really during the Second World War, which is, I believe, when it, it earned its nickname, the Rangers. Um, uh, the London Regiment was huge, of course. This battalion was just a small part of it. And during the First World War, various battalions of the London Regiment were sent all over the place. Some were sent to the Dardanelles to fight the Gallipoli campaign. Some were sent to Salonika. Some were sent to Palestine. One was even sent to Afghanistan. And I didn't even realize there was that much fighting in Afghanistan. But the Rangers had the terrible misfortune of being sent to the Western Front, one place you really didn't want to get sent in August 1914. So, <coughs> but when was um, Francis there? So when we look at his Silver War Badge record, that actually gives us a date for his enlistment. It shows that he enlisted on the 11th of December, um, in 1915, um, sorry, the 11th of December, 19, yeah, he, 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 they show that he, died, he enlisted on the 11th of December, 1915. So based on the sequencing of his service number, service numbers went up as more men joined. Um, it's, we can kind of get a rough idea of when he actually joined the battalion. And based on his service number, it looks like he didn't actually join the battalion until November 1916. So pretty much a year after he first attested, enlisted, volunteered, whatever you wanted to call it. And by the time he joined the battalion, he would have been 31 years old. So given his age, given the sequencing of his service number, and given the date of his enlistment, the 11th of December 1915, it's 99.9% .9 certain that he was again one of these volunteers that joined up under the Derby scheme. We discussed the Derby scheme last week, but if you're joint, if you if you missed last week, don't know what the Derby scheme is. The Derby scheme was basically a recruitment drive that aimed to avoid the need for conscription at the early on in the war by allowing men to voluntarily attest for service at a later date. So they'd attest 
but they wouldn't be called up straight away. They could be called up later when the army needed them. And this matches perfectly with what we're seeing here, especially that when you think that the Derby scheme ended on the 12th of December 1915 and Francis attested on the 11th. It just matches up so perfectly. So he would have been one of these Derby scheme volunteers that, full of jingoism and patriotism, marched off down to the recruitment office with his pals to go off with a willing heart, fight for king and country, with very little comprehension of what was to come. Um, <clears throat> so while we only have a little bit, one scrap of the service record, we can take a look at um, the history of the battalion, the Rangers, and that can give us a rough, we can't say for certain, but it can give us some clues about, to where, about where Francis may have been and some of the battles he might of fought in. So when you look at the Rangers' battle honours, they have a lot, uh, which shows what a rotten time they had of it, to use the language of, of the day. So um, again, because we don't have a full service record and we don't have a uh, medical record, a full list of medical records for Francis, he could have been wounded out and missed certain engagements, but we can at least assume that he could have been at the battles of Passchendaele, um, during the summer and autumn of 1917, the Rangers were there, as well as the battles of Arras and Cambrai as well. The, the Rangers were very, very heavily involved in those battles. Um, but it didn't stop for them. In 1918, they continued to experience very, very heavy losses as they endured fierce combat through pretty much the entire war right up to the end. Um, they were also at the front lines of battles such as the Second Battle of Somme, Amiens, uh, the Palm, uh, Battle of the Hindenburg Line, um, but Francis wouldn't have been at the Battle of the Hindenburg Line. Uh, I don't think he would have been at Amiens either because he, he was out by that point. And uh, that's because the one page we have of his service record um, gives quite an, an interesting piece of information. It, the only piece of information we have out of the whole of his service record, unfortunately for Francis, is that he was brief, briefly treated at stationary hospital at a stationary hospital so this wouldn't have been a field hospital it was a big proper stationary hospital in the ancient french city of rouen or rouen um, and the nature of his wound suggests that although he was a say, wound with air commas that he, although he was removed from the lines he probably wouldn't have been action out that long because uh, francis hadn't been shot he hadn't been gassed, he hadn't been shelled, but he'd actually come down with a very nasty case of hemorrhoids. Yes, the reason for his uh, hospitalisation was listed as piles. And um, this was actually a very, very, very common ailment. It was a fact of trench life for many men on the front lines of the Western Front. And the reasons for that are actually pretty obvious. Maintaining head hygiene in a very, very muddy, wet trench with shells bursting over your head wasn't easy. But when you combine that, I'm sorry to be graphing, but when you combine that with the hours and hours and hours you spend sitting on cold, damp, often sodden earth, um, it basically recipe for disaster. And you will find piles are referenced incredibly frequently in many World War One Army records. It was a very, very common ailment for the common Tommy of the First World War. So uh, thankfully, Francis survived his piles and the war. Uh, and he was discharged on September 11th, 1918, under paragraph 2D of Army Order 265, uh, paragraph 392, King's, Regula King's Regulation 6. Uh, and I, I looked at it, that, that was in his Civil War badge record. So again, medal records can give you more information than you probably realise. But basically all this means that he was classed as one of those who was having served as a soldier and being now over military age, have been discharged other than for misconduct. That's the official section of that paragraph from uh, the King's Military Regulations. Uh, we can find him in the 1939 register, shows that he returned to Brighton after the war, returned to his career in furniture, uh, this time working as a furniture decorator, uh, and spent the rest of his life at 21 Vinton Whale Greenways with his widowed mother, Emily, and his wife, Selina, before he sadly passed away in 1955 at the age of 70. Uh, not particularly old, but not particularly uh, young either. Um, so I'm I hope you're enjoying this. This is a lot of uh, um, a lot of information I'm basically waffling on about. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just seeing some in in interesting comments I wanted to read. Uh, I said. 
Oh yeah, to anyone watching in Australia, again, sorry, um, to Sharon and to anyone else, um, I hope you haven't been too badly affected by the bushfires. We are all hoping for more rain in Australia, fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, no, thank you to everyone who's helping other people with tips. Lovely to see you all chatting and discussing. And hello, Marcus. Oh, Marcus Coverbatch. Hey, wow. Hey, that's cool. Well, if you're watching this, Marcus, I hope you have found something interesting. I'm really thrilled to actually have a Coverbatch join, in, join us. That's, that's, that's awesome. Hello, Marcus. I'm very glad you're here. Um, anyway, yeah, back to Coverbatches. Oof, it's already 10 to 6. So. <clears throat> now it's time to take a look at the Benthams um, in a bit more detail. So we've looked at Francis Leonard Holtham. Now it is time to look at the Benthams, which is Benedict's mother's paternal line. So Benedict, and, and this is where, I promise I'll get to it eventually, this is where the murder mystery comes out. If you've stuck around, well done, because we're getting to the good bit now. So Benedict's maternal grandfather, a chap named Frederick, Frederick Howard Ventham, was born on the 27th of March in Sussex. Um, he appears in the 1911 census with his parents, Frederick, William and Mabel Ventham. Um, and actually, I'm probably... No, I will go through them because it shows how they, were, they weren't as well to do. So... Actually, no, I'm going to skip straight to the murder. Straight to the murder. So it all starts with a young, with a chap called, actually no, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing this very well here. Uh, it all, I, ne I need to explain the tree, otherwise you won't understand who, who the murderer, well, he wasn't convicted as a murderer, but he killed someone, um, who he was. So anyway, so yeah, so you've got Frederick William Bentham, uh, what, so he was, he appears in the 1911 census. He is uh, Benedict's maternal, sorry, Benedict's maternal great great grandfather. Uh, he was a domestic coachman, uh, and his wife Mabel was born in Bromley, Kent. They they had two children, uh, and it looks like Frederick moved around quite a lot because the birthplace of his daughter Edith Maud Bentham was shown as Croydon when the family seemingly never lived there outside of the census. Um, As we continue to go back through the censuses, um, we find the household of William Bentham, who was a 32-year-old general agriculture. William Bentham was um, Frederick, Frederick's grandfather. So the, Frederick's father was James, and James's father was William. Um, so anyway, this is where it gets interesting. So William Bentham, agricultural labourer, born at Orbridge, and wife Sarah, uh, they had their children were Annie, George, Frederick, Arthur, and Henry, uh, and all were born all were born at Orbridge. Um, and in 1891, you find the, the family at One Common Road in Micklemarsh. This is in the census, by the way. William's 42, Sarah's 39, and all the children are in the census except for Henry. So you've got uh, you've got Frederick, who's then 16, also an agricultural labourer. You've got Arthur, 14, also an agricultural labourer. Edward eight, Charles five, Edith two, and they're all there. Henry, though, the, sec uh, the third son, isn't in there at all. But when we look for him, we know he was born um, in, I can't remember when he exactly was born, uh, but if we, if we search for him, we, we actually find him in the 1891 census at another property just down the road. So he was living at the property of a farm, a farm called William Alden, and he was working there as a cowboy, uh, just 13 years of age, could be that he was apprenticing. I don't know if you apprenticed to be a cowboy or maybe the family were struggling and Henry had been sent to live with this farmer to earn his own keep and ease the burden. Uh, or it could be that Henry had been acting out and he was too much for the family because Henry... Um, oh, apparently we've had some gremlins. Oh, can you hear me now, guys? Oh, so people can hear me. Oh, hello? Hello? I hope, well, I hope you can hear me. Do let me know if you can't. Um, just see what people are saying.
Oh, no, I think it, yeah. Oh, Sharon's just given us a file on the updates on the fires. It's Baden, Gippsland, bushfires there are horrendous. We are getting Gibson smoke. Oh, I hope you guys are all right. Stay safe. Sorry, back to the back to the medicine. As I said, so in the in the 1891 census, young Henry Bentham, 13-year-old Henry Bentham, wasn't living with the main family. He'd been sent off to live with a farmer down the road. Um, and that's when we got curious. We thought, oh, Henry seems a bit of a mysterious figure. So we popped his name into a broader search, and that's when we found the shocking discovery that in November 1893, when he was aged just 14, so not long after the not long he was not long after he was found in uh, at the at the property of William Alden in the 1891 census, uh, he was tried at the Hampshire Auter Assizes in Winchester for the for a murder a murder at Micklemarsh of another boy called Frederick Betteridge. So really sad case this. Um, so basically he appeared, so Henry appears in our calendar of prisoners tried at the Assizes in the, um, Assizes, Assizes, I can never pronounce that, uh, in the Crime Prisons and Punishment Collection, 1770 to 1934, one of our best collections. If you haven't searched it yet, do, it's so good. There's so much interesting stuff in there, but, um, there you see Henry Ventham entered in the calendar of prisoners, stating very clearly that he'd been charged with the murder of Frederick Betteridge. Um, and I mean, that's when we're like, wow, shocking discovery time. Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays a detective solving murders, has an ancestor that committed a murder. Um, and that's when we've had to find out more. So we popped his name into the newspaper collection. And as with military records, crime records, the crossover between crime records and newspapers is incredible. If you find a name in the crime records, you will almost certainly find out more information than newspapers. You've got to try searching. You just have to. It's too much of an opportunity to miss. And when we did this, straight away, we found about 30 reports all relating to this specific case, some of them going into incredible amounts of detail, uh, covering the, the actual event itself, the boy's committal from the coroner's court, all the subsequent trials, the verdicts of the juries, judges' reports, really, 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 really detailed. I mean, the most detailed one, though, was in the Hampshire Advertiser, printed on Saturday, Saturday the 18th of November, 1893, and it was headed the Rumsey Stabbing Case. And um, in fact, this story was actually syndicated in papers all over the country. It wasn't just in... Um, Hampshire. You've, it was reported about the length and the breadth of the UK because it was kids killing kids. As back then, it was as shocking as it you know shocking like it would be today. Um, but anyway, what happened? Um, really, really sad case. So basically, it all started with a pleasant afternoon spent uh, looking for nuts and blackberry picking. So Henry Bentham, his mate uh, Fred Betteridge and another boy who wasn't named, three of them set out to gather nuts and blackberries from the surrounding hedgerows. And um, a couple of days later, Frederick was dead. Um, the prosecution alleged that there'd been a row between Henry and Frederick, possibly over the spoils of their blackberry picking, who knows? Uh, and they, it, got out of hand and um, Henry stabbed his friend with, with, with a knife and Frederick subsequently died a few days later of his injuries. Um, Ventham was defended by a barrister called Bullen. This is all laid out in incredible amounts of detail in the newspapers. Uh, Bullen was the recorder of Southampton um, and he was appointed by the judge um, uh, who was called Mr. H Mr. Mr. Justice Hawkins, if you, were, if you were wondering. You probably weren't, but if you were, there you go. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting case, actually, because um, the evidence does appear stacked against young Henry Bentham, but he was um, actually acquitted. Um, he was found not guilty of both murder and manslaughter. So I'll read one of the newspaper reports and then I'll tell you a little bit more and you can make up your own mind as to what you thought, what you think happened. So this is a report from the Western Gazette title uh, printed Friday, 29th of September, 1893. <clears throat> and it was um, alleged murder by a boy at Romsey. 
So it goes, uh, at the Romsey County Police Court on Thursday, September 20th, uh, 21st, before Colonel Griffiths and Major uh, Trahan, uh, Henry Ventham, a lad aged between 13 and 14 years of age, was brought up in custody, charged on remand with having on the 13th of August, maliciously, feloniously and willfully and of malice of forethought, killed and murdered one Frederick Batteridge. Mr. C. Lamport of Southampton appeared for the prisoner. There was a very full attendance of the public, the case having excited considerable public interest. Superintendent Miller of Andover was in charge of the case. Inspector Payne, having to be in the north of England on business, uh, or just a load of legal stuff. Anyway, he stated uh, that he, uh, sorry, uh, one of the, so then we'll get to the depositions. One of the depositions was Richard Bretteridge, the father of the deceased, a labourer. Uh, he stated that he was a fitter on the line. He had a son, Frederick, 12 years old. Oh, 12 years old. Uh, he would have been 13 in November. On the evening of August the 13th, he found him at home in bed in the evening. He had since died on September the 5th. He did not make any statement to him during his illness. Albert, L Albert Luffman, ah, this will be the third lad that was brought in, aged 14, living at Arrowbridge, was called uh, before the coroner's court. He said he remembered Sunday, August the 13th very well. He went out with Frederick and Henry Bentham, nutting in the copse down Cook's Lane. They then came upon the lane and stopped to pick some blackberries. They were all together, and while picking the blackberries, nothing happened. The witness did not hear any quarrel, but he saw the prisoner and Batteridge together. After that, witnesses, the witness said he saw Batteridge run up against Bentham in the lane. He then saw Batteridge go and lie down on the grass. He did not say anything, neither did Bentham. Batteridge told Bentham to go and get some water. He knew something had happened. Um, to, he knew so, and that something had gone into him, Bentham's knife. He did not see the knife going, but knew it was Bentham's knife because he was with Bentham the night he had bought it. He asked Bentham that what was the matter with Batteridge, and he said he had been he had been and run a knife into him. Odd, uh, odd phrasing. Uh, the witness looked, looked at Batteridge and saw the cut. It was bleeding smartish a lot, uh, and, rather fr and, and Batteridge appeared rather frightened. Uh, the witness went down and met, met Ventham with the, with the water. Basically, they came back, splashed the deceased's face. Um, Batteridge was taken to his home to recover. So the two versions of events were that um, Henry Ventham alleged that Frederick Batteridge had ran into him and accidentally stabbed himself. Uh, while Frederick was actually quite clear that Frederick, uh, that, that Henry had willfully stabbed him. So um, I'm not going to read it all, but in the one of the other reports, the one titled the Romsey Stabbing Case, one of the things I find amazing, and th this was actually brought up in the trial, and this could have been some of the reasons that he was acquitted, was that um, a police officer, the local constable, took Henry Bentham into the bedroom of the dying Frederick Betteridge and questioned them both in the same room. He, he, he even allowed Henry Bentham to question his victim, which is staggering. Um, but one, and, the, and the judges noted this was very irregular and it shouldn't have been done. They also noted that no solicitors were present and no one had any legal representation of any kind. But one of the things that did come out during this questioning was um, um, one of the questions that was asked was, uh, and this is in quotes, the, the first question that was asked was, did, um, didn't I stab you accidental? And apparently the deceased very firmly said no. Despite this, Henry was still acquitted. Um, and apparently the um, verdict went down very, very well. And there was rounds of applause in the gallery. It could be that Henry was a popular young lad. It could have been that the, um, the courthouse was packed out with relatives. Um, who knows? But yeah, fascinating case. It's not up on our blog yet. Um, we will write about we will we will write about it at some point, but yeah, there you go. That that is oh, how are they related? That's what I should say as well. So um basically to summarize, um the jury accepted Henry's version of events. They confirmed it was an accident, found him not guilty of both murder and manslaughter. Uh Hampshire advertiser concluded it as thus. They said his lordship was quite content with the view they had taken of the case. There was significant applause in court. Um the jury's verdict was a popular one, um, but as I said, of course, that could have been because it was packed out with his family members. So Henry Bentham, being the younger brother of Benedict Cumberbatch's great-grandfather, Frederick William Bentham, is Benedict's great-great-uncle. So there you have it. 
They don't come back to his great great uncle. Um, was hauled up in court for um, the tragic death of a one of his mates when he was only 13. To this day, we will never know the truth. Maybe it was, uh, you know, tragic example of boys being boys getting out of hand and they were just too boisterous and he did accidentally run on the, the knife. Maybe there was a fight that got out of hand and the knife was used. We will never know. Uh, but Henry uh, didn't go to prison. He went on and probably had families of his own. Haven't traced him yet, but yeah. That is Benedict's connection to uh, a Victorian murder mystery. Uh, given the time, really sadly, I don't even want to have the time on, to touch on rationing. I know I promised it in the um, description, but I think I'm going to have to leave it for this week because I've got a birthday party I need to be at. It's a dinner one, so I can't really be late. Uh, but I will leave it at that for now. Um, uh, lovely. Uh, again, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Looks like there's been... So, oh, no. Ah, so another one from uh, Claire Jerry Brown, someone else watching in Australia, uh, one of our top fans. Hi, Claire. I uh, think smoke from local bushfires was not good, but I'm about half an hour away. Fire smoke from Kangaroo Island also came across. Whoa. It made me cough bad one night. Uh, the tour down under uh, by six, we were riding through Adelaide Hills, um, bushier area. Lot, oh, lots of koalas died on Kangaroo Island and many in care in South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and many other wildlife. Um, Oh, wow. Well, thank you for updating us, Clara. I do hope that you and everyone else watching in Australia stay safe uh, and that you are okay. Um, all the best. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> have a wonderful uh, wonderful weekend, everybody. Hope you enjoyed my uh, warbled um, description of Benedict Cumberbatch's family tree. I'll be back again next week with Scottish records and some other interesting stuff as well. Um, but yeah, have a wonderful weekend. Happy ancestors, happy ancestor hunting. Hunting. <coughs> Apologies, we didn't get to touch on rationing. Uh, I do have some interesting stuff that I can share with you at a later date. But I will see you all again soon. Um, sending love to Australia as well. Um, and I will in the comments when I leave, I will post a blog link, uh, a blog I wrote about Benedict's ancestors. But we didn't really include the murder in that. We kept that separate. I saved that for you guys. Um, but yeah, if you want to know about uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's World War One connections, check out the blog. I will post it in the comments. Uh, but yeah, lovely to see you all. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you again next week. Take it easy. Bye bye.